So welcome to Conversations with Audio Makers. This is one of our two such sessions at this year's audio festival, Bangoya, organized by the Inconvenient Films. My name is Vaida Pilibuitita, and I'm a journalist and documentary producer with the Lithuanian national broadcaster, LRT. And it is my great pleasure to present you our guests tonight, three Ukrainian journalists, podcast producers, and hosts. So it's Katerina Litvinchova from an independent media and podcast platform, Urban Space Radio. She is a host and co-creator of the podcast UA, The Day That We Survived. Welcome, Katerina. It's are you. Uh, also, Olga Snisarchuk, journalist and uh, host of podcast Here and Now, Tuti Teper, and Ukrainian Stories of Journalists at the War, a project by PEN Ukraine in collaboration with Georgi Gongadze Prize and independent media organization, The Ukrainians. Welcome, Olha. And Dr. Volodymyr Yermolenko, Ukrainian philosopher, journalist, and writer, chief editor of UkraineWorld.org and co-founder and author of podcasts Explaining Ukraine and Cult Podcast. Welcome, Volodymyr. Uh, we really appreciate you being here um, uh, on such a symbolic day when Ukraine marks its Independence Day, but also six months from the start of full-scale invasion by Russia. So we understand this day is different for Ukrainians. So um, thank you again for being here with us. Um, during the next hour, we wanted to talk to you about your audio work, uh, which many of us here in Lithuania have been following and admiring for the past six months. Uh, uh, just like work of all Ukrainian journalists, uh, and we would like to uh, to hear more on how it was before and after 20, 20, uh, February 24th and uh, how your audience expectations have been changing and what it means to be a journalist when your country is at war. Um, and just a reminder for our audience, uh, festival audience, uh, you are welcome to send your questions uh, over the Q&A function, and I will pass them over to our part participants. I will be checking on that uh, on that box uh, as uh, as the hour progresses. So, but first in the beginning, uh, we would like to know more a bit about you. If you could tell us a little bit about the organizations you represent and audio podcast you have been producing before the invasion. Uh, Katerina, maybe we can start with you. Uh, I know Urban Space Radio is, as I said, independent media organization. It's based in Ivana Frankivsk, where you are now. and. Uh, You've been producing, your organization has been producing many different podcasts in Ukrainian uh, before the February 24th. If you can just give us an overview of what those are. Uh, yes. Hi. Uh, yeah, we actually um, are making podcasts since, I guess, 2015. Uh, we were like one of the first podcast studios in Ukraine. And uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, mainly Ukrainian language content for our <laughs> Ukrainian uh, audience, and um, I guess for the last couple uh, couple of years, we um, mostly uh, were focusing on um, uh, three uh, three uh, directions, like um, maintaining and supporting uh, Ukrainians uh, in uh, reaching these twenty first century skills, we would say, uh, for example, mental health, critical thinking, and so on. Uh, the second dire direction was um, uh, to promote our culture, uh, music, uh, various styles, uh, Ukrainian music about our singers uh, since uh, independence and uh, till nowadays. And uh, the third one, uh, which uh, uh, for me personally was like the most important for the last years. Um, this was uh, searching for actually Ukrainian identity. Uh, we tried to explore Ukraine in, in its diversity. Uh, we, last year we had uh, this season uh, which uh, consisted of uh, three podcasts. Um, it named uh, Poshuk or search, uh, we'd say in English. And um, uh, it was about uh, Ukrainian traditional music of Ukrainian ethnic minorities. I mean, uh, Greeks, Jews, uh, Armenian people, uh, and so on and so forth. And um, we had uh, a broadcast about uh, their 
destiny of people and families who were repressed by Soviets uh, back in 20th century. And uh, a podcast about uh, Ukrainians uh, who witnessed uh, all these like challenging times, revolutions, the changing of uh, authorities and so on and so forth uh, from their window. Like it is their podcast of uh, cities and people in cities uh, who actually face uh, these challenging times. And actually before uh, the 24th uh, of uh, February, uh, we were working on a season um, on a business season, uh, we would like to tell people about their co-citizens, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, like modern young Ukrainian entrepreneurs, uh, about how they use like community building um, approaches in their work, how they uh, face uh, like modern challenges, for example, how they um, involve into uh, circular economy. Uh, approaches and also how they um, uh, how they help their communities. Um, yeah, and we, we were planning a lot uh, connecting about uh, connecting with business, and um, we actually have to switch our main topic and main goal. Uh, but still, now uh, six months later, we somehow managed to incorporate some kind of business stories, inspiring business stories about Ukrainian entrepreneurs in what we are doing about this uh, podcast, which is covering uh, Russia's full-scale invasion yes. uh, into Ukraine. Yeah, I, I guess I'll stop there. So we, will, we will talk about what you're working on definitely uh, now, but um, still uh, until February 24th. Volodymyr, your NGO, Internews Ukraine, you had this podcast explaining Ukraine even before uh, before this year, before this February, for several years. Uh, uh, I'm not sure about cool podcast. You will tell us uh, yourself. But as I understand, explaining U Ukraine, a podcast in English, already dealt with uh, a lot of um, topics related to Russian aggression um, even before the war. So this was, so to say, not a new topic that you took uh, took up this year, right? Of course, yes. Uh, Ukraine World uh, dates from uh, as a as an initiative, as a networking initiative. It dates from the Revolution of Dignity from Euromaidan. Then we set up a website, I think, in 2015, and then we gradually uh, were started making podcasts. But uh, we were making podcasts one per one once per month, I think, and. Uh, when uh, when we have seen the uh, uh, the build up of troops of russian troops along the border from the late 2021 to early 2022 we started doing it much more often and after the full scale invasion we actually the the majority of these podcasts are done with my wife and, and co-host tetiana harkova and um it was kind of uh, uh, we were making it in a very various situations. So uh, when we were uh, when we were relocalizing, delocalizing our families, for example, our kids and our parents, we were in for some time in Kamenets Podilsky, and and we would be making podcasts almost every day there. And uh, finally, our pace was kind of a three four episodes per week. So it was really constant. Uh, constant reporting because we understood that for international audiences podcast is a very useful tool and we have we had lots of feedback really lots of feedback and many people are writing to us and many international journalists actually are addressing us and saying look you 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 touched upon these topics in your podcasts can we talk about this so our task was twofold uh, to uh, to tell the story of the war of course we also collecting lots of personal stories so it's kind of a storytelling but at the same time analytic and analysis we travel uh, across ukraine to the places which which suffered from the war in kiev oblast chernihiv oblast kharkiv uh, so so many different places but we also try to we are not 
we are not considering ourselves as professional journalists. We are actually university uh, teachers, and uh, we are both have doctorates in, in in France. So we are we're trying also to give the context, the intellectual context, and uh, to give the more sense for international audience. What is Ukraine? What is its culture, its history? And of course, uh, we are trying to engage uh, more speakers, not only ourselves, uh, the cultural actors, both from Ukraine and from abroad. And um, we have lots of plans for, for the future. Actually, we want to engage more uh, famous public intellectuals uh, worldwide to, to discuss maybe even the global topics uh, linked to Ukraine. And we're also launching a podcast in French. And uh, I'm, we are working also in launching a podcast in German. So uh, we really want to cover as many languages as possible. And... Um, and if you want, I can tell you more about our Ukrainian podcast, which is also quite interesting. Uh, we, we will, yeah, we, uh, just uh, in, in a minute, I was just, uh, I, of course, uh, it's very, very interesting what uh, you, you will, your future plans. Uh, you know, I wanted to make a joke here, thinking that there must be at least three Volodymyr Zermolenko <laughs> with all the work you're doing, <laughs> podcasts in different languages, in different duties. I have a response to that. I have three children, so probably they're, they're doing the work for us as well. Multitasking. <laughs> yeah, yes, so somehow, really, this is amazing. The, the, the amount and the intensity that you mentioned, I really remember, I think I remember, uh, re discovered explaining Ukraine quite early on, uh, the, the, after the invasion started, and I was, you know, it felt like there was a new episode almost every day, you know, with updates, what's going on, but also with this very calm, contained, sometimes with air raid sirens in the background, uh, um, discussion about the literature and of imperialistic, uh, you know, uh, ambitions of Russia ingrained in, in, in classical works and, you know, or the complexities of uh, Ukrainian la language situation. And um, it was really, like, really calming and therapeutic, I must say, even though, of course, um, um, at, le at least for us in the Baltic states, uh, we were lost. I know many colleagues of mine and journalists, we were lost. We didn't know how to approach our own work. Uh, and uh, we are further away from the front line. And here you are, Ukrainian journalists uh, releasing podcast episodes um, every three days. Or I think in case of Urban Space Radio, uh, you started your English language uh, the day that we survived. Uh, also, I think March 1st, uh, really early on. Uh, in the war. But as uh, we will go to this um, uh, quickly, I just wanted to ask Olha also to introduce her work, what you've been doing before uh, February 24th. Now you're host of podcasts of journalists at war, where you talk to Ukrainian journalists uh, uh, who are covering the war. Uh, I think there will be 15 episodes. There must be 11, I think, out now. It's in Ukrainian. But just for our audiences, I wanted to say there are brilliant text summaries online as well in a dedicated website. Uh, if you Google here and now, I think with the English name, you should be able to find it as well. Can you tell us a bit more what you did before and how you arrived uh, to this uh, series, which I think started in April, so also quite early? Mm -hmm. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, thank you, Vaida. But uh, first of all, um, primiausia, noriu pasakyti aičio Lietuvę ir visiems kiekvieną lietuviams, kad jūs turite jūsų paramą ir pagalbą Ukrainoje labai labai jums visiems aičiau. Uh, just a few words. Uh, thank you that, for yeah. <laughs> You know, Vaida first uh, when wrote me, she wrote in Ukrainian, so I think that uh, she is Ukrainian, but no. So it's my, <laughs> my thank you for you. And uh, what about podcast? Uh, you just uh, tell that we have um, a page. Um, if you cannot uh, listen in Ukrainian, you can read uh, this translation of um, translator, uh, great translator Anna Vovchenka. And um, uh, this is a podcast. It's not my uh, oven podcast. It's a podcast of a free organization with support. And uh, I was invited as a host. And if you ask me what I did before, the war I was uh, I used to work in television so I didn't have uh, my uh, podcast and I have uh, 
have ever um, work with podcast or with audio uh, or with audio but i have a job on television but uh, um, like a joke but i have a vacation uh, previous year so i um, just uh, want to make a post uh, in uh, journalism but and have another plans uh, uh, till uh, from uh, maybe from march but of course uh, for change everything so um so i was invited uh, to listen uh, this story of my colleagues uh, um i um, think that it's a really important job because uh, all of us all of journalists have a um, big uh, stories uh, which they haven't placed for example uh, to um, to tell a big aud audience so uh, i think that uh, uh, even all of journalists have that kind of story and uh, when you say, say about that uh, we have emotion or cried after this story so i don't cry but um, for me, uh, really important to show how uh, great was choice for uh, even citizen, for even journalist, uh, because uh, all of my colleagues uh, have and still have that choice. They uh, think or they have uh, should have uh, um, fight with weapon or uh, should fight with word. So. For me, it's a really, really uh, important uh, project, and I really appreciate that you uh, listen it and uh, you want to know how hard of work uh, Ukrainian journalists. Thank you. Thank you, Olha. Yeah, of course. Uh, in and I don't think we get at least early in the war um, we or the full scale invasion uh, more correctly. We haven't heard those uh, stories from so up close of first-hand stories of journalists, uh, what it feels for them uh, to about the, the, the trauma and the ethical dilemmas and also the tension between the foreign journalists who come to Ukraine to cover the war. So I thought uh, there were a lot of interesting stories and really moving uh, um, accounts. And it's also a very important document uh, of the war. But if we go back to what uh, uh, those podcasts that you started uh, releasing quite uh, your you and your organizations with colleagues so early on during the war um it correct me if i'm wrong but i have a feeling uh, there were quite quickly quite a few podcasts in english about ukraine and the invasion some of them were, were produced by big organizations such as bbc or npr uh, and um, uh, Volodymyr, like yours, you've you've had already, you know, you said that the 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 you were releasing them maybe once a month, not three times a week, but uh, sort of the setup was, I guess, ready. And uh, uh, you know, you, you you mentioned yourself, it was uh, really important to provide a first-hand accounts of the first days and weeks of invasion in English for audiences abroad. Uh, to fill the gap, I imagine, that you saw uh, in the international media that, I don't know, again, uh, would be interesting to hear your impression. My impression was that there was a lot of uh, confusion, which is, I guess, understandable, how things are named, how things were covered, and you were there you know, really early on to do it. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about motivation? I know Katerina also, English language podcast was not something that you did as Urban Space Radio and you started documenting, putting out these stories, translated into English also first three days of the war. So can you tell me how, can you take us back to those first days? What was your process? Where did you find strength? Because I imagine as many other Ukrainians, you had other things to consider and they were um, documenting the war first days. I don't know who Volodymyr, maybe you. Where we find strength, well, I think I would I would rephrase the question. If we didn't make, if we didn't do what we did, uh, we would certainly not find strength. So obviously, as I think everybody of us just felt the immense responsibility and the need to do something. And as Olha mentioned, this is a real real choice whether you you go to the front line or or you do something not on the front line 
uh, I think Ukraine is now like a, like a living organism where everybody is perceiving himself or herself as a yes of an interesting individual, of course, but it, it comes to the second second plan. And the first, I always joke that our our profession of all of us is to be citizens of Ukraine, and uh, this this comes to the to the first place. So we actually just um, you know. Sometimes the war changes people dramatically and uh, people went just take an absolutely new role. And this is fantastic, this transformative power of the war. Uh, I am, for example, a person who finds it very difficult to change uh, throughout life. So I, I, I prefer to just to intensify things that, that uh, I was doing before. And I was, I was in this media of international journalists and experts and analysts and intellectuals uh, before this full-scale invasion. So, of course, we just intensified our effort, efforts. Uh, with the international media, it was like huge wave of, of course, of comments, of interviews, of live, uh, li live comments. And we, were, we had sometimes for 10, 10 TV programs per day, uh, except for our podcasts. Uh, and apart from that, there, there is family, kids, uh, uh, relocation, uh, volunteering, and all the rest. But I think it's just um, something, some, something very natural, uh, na natural for all of us. So, uh, so this is it. As as for coverage of the international media, so I think it's it's getting much better. It's got much better compared to 2014 when. A typical story of international media who would come to Maidan was to ask, show me the far right, so show me the neo-Nazis here. And uh, it took us like several years maybe to explain that, yes, there are probably far rights in Ukraine, but you should localize them. You should kind of see their, their scale. Their scale is, is not that big as you imagine. It's, it's probably several percent politically of the, of the whole political spectrum. So now we, we, we increasingly have less problems with that. I think there are, there are other situations, other, other problems like sometimes uh, international media, I guess they, they also come with the cliches that Ukraine is all only about corruption and everything which will uh, uh, go here will just disappear like in a black hole. And, and it's a, absolutely ab absurd um, estimation of what, what the country is and how it changed it during these eight months, eight years since 2014. And uh, we also try to explain that, look, yes, corruption is present as everywhere in the world, but look how, it, how much more efficient public institutions have become and uh, how the army have become much more efficient. So it's also naive to think that Ukrainian resistance, it's all the work of the volunteers in territorial defense. It's there, of course, they were extremely important, but actually the army was quite prepared, maybe not, not uh, prepared in the ideal way, but uh, much better prepared than in 2014. And, um, and, um, and the incredible story, I think Katarina and Olha will agree with me on that, is that you always find incredible human stories. And I think my formula would be that the war makes ordinary people act extraordinary. And this is probably the, the definition of, of heroism, what hero is. The, the hero is an ordinary person who at some moment of his or her life just acts extraordinary. And uh, we see so many stories and not necessarily of people go into the front line, people who survived occupation, people who evacuated the, the people from the villages, the heads, headmen of, of the villages who uh, in most cases just stayed with the, with the people despite the fact that 80% of, of the dwellers of the village would of course evacuate, but he, he or she would stay with, with those people who stayed in the village. So there are so many incredible stories and um, I think we have at Ukraine World also the, the chapter stories or, or testimonials in which we were trying to collect the stories of, of these people. I think this is one of the most incredible things.
Yeah, and you heard them firsthand as you traveled in Kyiv region and elsewhere once uh, once um, uh, the region was uh, liberated from the true Russian troops when they retreated. Katerina, you uh, were uh, 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 in publishing this podcast the day that we survived, which is solely, I don't know, it, it may have changed now, but it was from the very beginning, the accounts recorded by Ukrainians on their phones uh, uh, about the what was what was happening to them, right, from early on in the war. Can you tell us a bit more about it? How did you collect those stories? How you say that you fact-check those stories and you were translating them, I know, with colleagues um, basically as a volunteer work as well. This was not the project that you planned. You know, this is not something that you planned, but how did the idea come up? And I think you were... Um, you released also 15 or so episodes until April, and I think new season is coming up. Can you tell us more about your podcast in English? Yeah, I actually, I can really much uh, appeal to what Vladimir has mentioned. Uh, yes, and um, actually we, on Urban Space Radio, we want people, we want Ukrainians to um, tell their stories by themselves. It was like our first intention uh, so that we um, asked people on social media, on social media of our urban space radio and also on our own accounts. Uh, we asked our colleagues and friends at first uh, from different cities and villages of Ukraine on how they are actually doing, what um, are they seeing or witnessing or experiencing or feeling uh, where they are like right now what is, what is going on in there um, yeah and we invite actually uh, people who are ready to speak up for themselves uh, who actually feel that they have a message for the world to be heard and they uh, want to send it uh, so we invite them to do it with the help of Urban Space Radio. Uh, we received uh, some stories in English and some stories uh, we translated uh, from Ukrainian or Russian into English. Um, yeah, and actually how we came up with the idea, I guess it was uh, the 27th of February when uh, my colleague, Natalia Padrukeva, uh, she's uh, the producer on Urban Space Radio, uh, she managed to uh, flee from Kiev with uh, her small baby um, in a safe place. And we started this discussion inside our team. What, what can we do? And uh, this, I mean, what, what I can appeal to from what uh, Voldemort has said, yes, that uh, we actually decided to do what we were doing before the 24th of February, what we can do what we are like experienced that maybe. So <laughs> we decided to continue to do it. Uh, but uh, the big challenge for us uh, was to, um, to reach a foreign audience, uh, English language audience. Uh, we, uh, we have never worked uh, with uh, these uh, people before, um, but we somehow <laughs> tried to identify what, what is important uh, um, D despite of the stories of real Ukrainians and their feelings, uh, we, uh, at the beginning, uh, we, I guess, we managed to cover new episodes like every day um, in March, uh, yeah, with the help of uh, our colleagues, uh, our uh, Ukrainian audio journalists. Uh, and also volunteers, uh, Ukrainians from abroad uh, and Ukrainians inside of Ukraine, Ukraine Catholic, uh, Catholic uh, University, the teachers and the students uh, of this uh, establishment, they help us also with translations. Um, yeah, and um, I'm sorry, I, I just have uh, a little mess in my head because uh, this is the air raid alarm it, it is going right now. So I try to... To process it so um yeah we add uh, some updates on what is going like every day it's um i'm answering this uh, part of the question about fact checking uh, so we use uh, only like official ukrainian sources uh, the ministries 
and like the data, actually the facts and the data, what was going on like on this specific date, like today, what, 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 what happened today. And we uh, tried to illustrate uh, these uh, facts uh, with uh, like feelings, emotions, how people actually processed uh, these facts and this new reality which, which, is, which was happening around them and which is happening right now. Uh, and uh, for now, uh, we completed like the first season of UA, the day that we survived, uh, and we started uh, the new one. Uh, what has changed? Uh, actually, it is uh, their, um, the approach we use, uh, because now we, we try to concentrate uh, on a specific topic in a specific episode, which is a message to a more concrete audience. Uh, for example, uh, recently we've covered uh, an episode about uh, Ukrainian farmers, Ukrainian land, the situation with grain, with ports, and uh, this agreement, how it works, how it works uh, for the country and for the real people, like in the villages and so on. Uh, we've covered uh, an episode about um, Ukrainian uh, high school graduates, how uh, these young people, uh, men and women experienced uh, their very important, uh, I guess, time of their lives, but unfortunately under the war. Um, yeah, and um, yeah, maybe I, I forgot something to cover. <laughs> I, maybe and I do it is, later. <laughs> this is in English as well, or is this in Ukrainian? Because I think your colleague yeah. mentioned that uh, you were uh, thinking of adapting some of the material that you've gathered uh, over the course of these months uh, also for Ukrainian audience, but with this um, different approach so as to yes, not yes. re-traumatize uh, Ukrainians, but uh, more of on focusing on stories that would help people survive, I guess. Yes, yes. For uh, international audience, we tried to, to, as you mentioned, uh, explain some things, some context, and so on and so forth. And uh, somehow uh, we managed to find, to uh, like explore uh, very inspiring stories from Ukrainians who, uh, who are suffering from the war and who are actually managed to uh, fighting back or in, in different kind of spheres. I mean, in business, in volunteering, uh, in uh, in in whatever <laughs> so uh, we listen to this to these stories uh, we as a team uh, we found them very um uh, very alive i would say very inspiring very powerful and we would like to share them with our uh, uh, co-citizens uh, and also um i think for us as urban space radio it was also important to uh, archivized to save the stories of people uh, who've been through the first uh, days of war and later on. So uh, we have uh, this partner um, uh, who actually um, uh, give us this, uh, not advice, but maybe <laughs> an opportunity to, to, to work with uh, uh, this uh, Ukrainian uh, language episodes. Uh, we try only to collect uh, for our audience uh, the stories which um, which keeps which keep us going through through the war uh, we have um, less episodes in ukrainian than we have in english and we do not um, explain to ukrainians what is going on like this news uh, part of information yeah only uh, what what keep us alive what keep us going only this part yeah thank you Volodymyr you mentioned uh, your podcast in Ukrainian the podcast cult and I I noticed that you restarted it also fairly recently after our I guess understandable break so I, I also want you and on also to talk about how you see how you approach differently the, the audio work that you do in Ukrainian and in English, because I think there are important distance, uh, di differences. Just like Katerina mentioned, there is the explaining part, I guess, that you don't need to do. But in, in, in cold, a cold podcast, I heard that you go into such questions as what is evil? What can Ukraine, 
give to the world. And these are also really thoughtful conversations that come back to the world, but from a, again, different perspective. Can you talk a bit more about that? How you just in your head, how you approach this differently? Yeah. Uh, so our Ukrainian podcast, which is called Kult Podcast, is actually also a family production. So, uh, and its motivation, we launched it in several years ago. Its motivation was very simple. Uh, we had uh, impressive conversations with my wife, Tatiana, about literature, philosophy, and culture when we were a bit younger. And uh, we would sit uh, every every e well, not every evening, evening but uh, several evenings per week with a glass of wine and discussing all the all things. But then, of course, when we when we were getting older, and um, the, the the family responsibilities, the the work responsibilities were kind of a more more heavy. Then we were starting losing this and. Uh, we just came up with the idea, okay, we should have a discipline. So we, we should come back to these conversations about, you know, Baudelaire, Nietzsche, Lesia Ukrainka, uh, Stoicism, uh, the Baroque culture, or whatever else. So we, we started this kind of the continuation of our, our, our family conversations. And um, it became quite, it appeared that people really needed, so we had a huge feedback. And um, we had several seasons. It was rather so. It, it is a podcast about culture and uh, culture, philosophy, literature. And uh, we were also engaging, of course, other people. We've made a cycle about Ukrainian culture with Suspilna, with public broadcaster, uh, about the key uh, personalities of the Ukrainian culture. And then when when this full scale invasion started, uh, we would telling ourselves, look, nobody needs this anymore. I mean, people would need something else. People would need really to, to think about our, the survival, the survival of our country, the, the help to the army. So we just uh, put it on hold. And um, the motivation, the key motivation when we why we restarted was actually, we were thinking, because we had the Patreon, and we were thinking, okay, now we were also starting doing our volunteer work because we have, uh, as we have three kids, we have bought a few years ago a, a, a minivan, a Renault Traffic, for the big space. And we are now using this minivan to uh, to transport uh, different kind of aid, humanitarian aid for civilians or aid for the military, to different parts of Ukraine. Uh, and we were telling ourselves, look, um, as we are already doing that, so that's that's a good thing to tell our patrons, look, we continue our cultural production, but all, all the money we collect through your patronage will go to these uh, volunteering things. And the same we're doing actually with explaining Ukraine with the Ukraine world. Uh, so we restarted this podcast actually to combine this information, cultural and the volunteering things. And it worked very well. So we were afraid that like, like people would, uh, would stop their subscriptions, stop their donations actually, uh, the trend was absolutely different. We had an uh, increase of audience, twofold increase of audience when we restarted. We just refocused a little bit. We started really talking not about uh, cert certain cultural characters, but about about the, the, the questions, the questions that really, uh, really, um, uh, really bother people about Ukrainian identity, Ukrainian culture, about our relations with Russia, about uh, the global culture as well, about Ukrainian culture. And then now, for example, when we go to Kharkiv, we collect all the money from our patrons. We, we buy some very, very useful things for our defenders. Uh, and then in Kharkiv, we, we, we give these things to our defenders and then we also record podcasts. So we were in the place, thanks to Kharkiv Literature Museum, Lit Musee, with Penny Ukraine, we were in the Shevelov apartment. Yuri Shevelov is one of our greatest intellectuals of the 20th century. And we've made, I think, four podcasts uh, during our very short stay in Ukraine. And they will be very interesting because it's a kind of a dialogue between Kyiv and Kharkiv and uh, we would be like telling more about the culture in Kharkiv and um, the, the executed renaissance or about some other other things. 
So it's appeared that uh, these things are extremely important for people too right now. And I think this is because it is the huge process of rethinking who we are, rethinking our identity. And we also launched a series Thinking in the Dark Times, uh, when we try to take the big philosophical problems, philosophical ideas, and think how our experience is actually provides a new a new glance on them, like the problems of evil or the problems of ideologies, the problems of fascism or all the rest. And I'm dreaming to do the same in English as well. Actually, I was thinking of my next uh, comment. Yeah, I said I would want to listen to this uh, also in English. Yeah. I really think we will we'll do something in English with these like talks with uh, globally famous intellectuals and under this uh, kind of Aggies thinking in the dark times. It's really impressive the amount of work you're doing. Olha, I wanted to ask you, I uh, keep thinking about those conversations with journalists uh, that uh, you recorded, beautifully produced, Tutti uh, Tiper. I really encourage uh, everyone to listen uh, even though these are conversation uh, podcasts, uh, um, I, th I guess I get the feeling that majority, I don't know, maybe um, you will correct me, but uh, in Ukraine also, there is this prevalence of um, talk podcasts, mostly they are conversations uh, with, with different people, but um, your Tutti Teper pod, uh, podcast, it's uh, produced beautifully. It, you, you listen to it almost like a narrative podcast because it's this monologue with uh, thoughtful interventions from Olha. Uh, talking to colleagues, and I, these are difficult conversations. Or I don't know how you um, planned them or handled them, or just provided a friendly listening ear to colleagues who needed to talk these things out. But uh, you get a lot of reflection about what it means to be a journalist, and also, um, you know, how it affects you personally, and. Uh, um, I don't know, do you get the feeling, who is your audience? Uh, I understand journalism community. They, I feel like we need these, uh, these mm -hmm. stories to be documented and told, but uh, you, do you, just like Volodymyr said, they, they, they feel the feedback. People need those uh, reflective uh, conversations. How about your podcast? So mm -hmm. Who is listening and, uh, and, and what feedback do you, do you get? Actually, Vaida, we have a sound producer. It's Dmitro Palchikov. And uh, at the start in, uh, on our project, uh, he just asked us, how do you imagine your listeners? And uh, we all, our small team, say that we um, can't imagine that it will be journalists. We think that it uh, will be usual people, uh, sim simple people, not journalists. So we decided, uh, we decided just to uh, talk for them, that kind of story. And um, um, also uh, Dmitro has a good advice, maybe for you it interesting, yes, so or for our listeners. He said to me uh, that we should uh, speak uh, like on the kitchen. And uh, it's not like television interview. I used to be a uh, host on the television and I also don't like this, you know, official style. But um, in that uh, case, uh, I, um, it's interesting for me. Yes, and uh, as Volodymyr said, about story around us. And I uh, just want you imagine uh, how, how it's true because the story is really around us. For example, before that uh, podcast, just on the street, uh, one March day, I met um, two photographers. I just add that we don't have at the time, time podcast. Uh, and it uh, was uh, Yevhen Maloletka and uh, Mstislav Chernov from Mariupol, and I was really, really surprised because it was the time um, their photograph from Mariupol, from birthplace, and uh, uh, our friend worried how they live the Mariupol, and I just meet uh, them on the street, and we just start to chatting and drink coffee and uh, listen to this hard story, and. Um, you know, and uh, when we 
uh, started podcast, I usually try to remember that, uh, memorize that uh, meeting because it was interesting for me. I just ask uh, what uh, what's interesting for me, how they live, where they, where they uh, have a breakfast, uh, exactly, um, how they scared. Uh, and, uh, you know, um, even when you uh, go, I don't know, like, uh, village Moshun or Hostomel uh, near the Kiev, uh, all of house full of stories. We um, were in uh, Moshun and we saw a woman, uh, one th- the only one thing she have after Russian safety, uh, it's her motorcycle and her cat, Zorik, it's that all. She don't have a house, she don't have a uh, um even a uh, documentary on that uh, air so um so you know um i sure that all of my guests uh, have that kind of story so uh, for me just interesting uh, how they live uh, with the story who they meet uh, in uh, their um, i don't know how they traveling it's not tra- war traveling yeah and um, and uh, I really try to ask uh, what uh, would be interesting for all. Uh, it's not about uh, what what is philosophy, uh, what is this journalism, how we uh, can to manage the situation. No, it's just simple things because all of us uh, in that uh, uh, day, uh, 24 of February, um, just woke up with explosion and. Uh, it's uh, no matter who you are before. Just uh, want to uh, want to add that 23 February, I'll go to the empty Borat Street and listen podcast uh, Volodymyr Yervolenko about uh, Domontovich episode about Domontovich uh, Ukrainian uh, Ukrainian um, pismanic. <laughs> Writer, yeah. Writer, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Just uh, as uh, say Katerina mess in our um, uh, head. Uh, sometimes I forgot Ukrainian word, not in not uh, in English. So yeah. I hope I answered to your question. Yes, and uh, I can attest to that that all these conversations they really feel like you feel like you travel with those journalists, uh, and it's um, can be really overwhelming. Uh, I told you already that. Uh, I felt like crying so many times just listening to these really honest, really raw, really, really, these, uh, these really touching accounts of those uh, journalists. And you can really under, uh, get, you get the feeling, uh, really, what, 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 it, what, what, it, what it feels, you know, as much, as much as you can get through the podcast, I guess. Um, since our time just ran like water, one question that really I wanted to ask all of you is, uh, I read this uh, opinion piece uh, by Dr. Sasha Dobzik. She is a, a writer and researcher from Zaporizhia. She lives between Ukraine and, and, and London, and she works also as so-called fixer, as I believe probably many of you have done this job helping foreign journalists to, um, you know, not only to cover the war, to just to report from Ukraine. And uh, this thought of her really stuck with me that um, she said that while doing this job, fixing, arranging interviews for foreign journalists in Ukraine, she feels the huge responsibility and power that the fixer has to fix in really direct, almost direct literal sense, many misconceptions and uh, from, I don't know, pronunciation of uh, local names of localities to preconceptions of what, I don't know, a war victim should look like or how Ukrainians feel. And just like this, I guess it's just the same explaining Ukraine work that you, Volodymyr, do and many of you do one while um, recording podcasts uh, for, for foreign audiences. Do you feel that now, six months on, you need to fix less of those mixed conceptions, that the world understands Ukraine better today? Um, and hopefully that uh, you know also helps uh, um, you know us get wake up closer to the victory, like Sergei Zhidan says every day. Is there less explaining that you have to do every day? Mm, maybe I can start with um, yeah with answering this question. Um, as for us, uh, we just switch from the audience we were. 
uh, at first focus at, like European audience, uh, USA audience, we tried to reach them firstly. We have this, like, somehow we decided it and we go with that. Uh, and now uh, we still uh, find out because of the comments, the feedback we re receive from people from different countries, like other than European countries. Uh, we see that uh, there are still a lot of places in the world uh, where Ukraine is um, mm, like they, they know less about Ukraine, but they are more into Russian propaganda. So we still need to, to reach these people, to tell them about our country, about our people, about our context, uh, and, uh, and so on. So we just switch, um, like, uh, maybe not switch, but wide our audience we, we try to speak to. Um, yeah, it's uh, mainly about targeting, uh, about uh, using this feedback, the questions which they write in their feedback, what they did not understand, don't get well, uh, this myth, myths, common, <laughs> common myths. Um, yeah, we try to work with, with this. We, we still believe we have enough work to do. Uh, let me jump in, maybe. When I was uh, uh, fixing uh, in during a revolution of dignity, uh, I had always uh, a mixed feeling because uh, on the one hand, there are different people, different journalists. Some of them are coming to the country where everybody looks at to do the, the job properly, professionally. Others are seeking for fame, looking for fame. Others looking for adventures. Other, others are looking for, uh, they, they just want to be good boys and good girls to implement the task of their ed editorial teams. So these are very different people. And we cannot just say about, wow, do international journalists understand Ukraine? Every, everything depends on a particular person and particular experience. Sometimes I had a, a very moral dilemma, very difficult for me, because the person would, the journalist would, would make a really good story. I understand that in the end it would be a really good story, very touchy, very emotional, and really influence the audience in France, let's say. But the instruments he or she would be using were very difficult to for, for me as a Ukrainian because they would kind of uh, intervene into very intimate fields, for example, of people who lost the the, the, the close ones or people who uh, who just you know experience uh, suffering or death, etc. For me, it was very difficult, uh, and therefore I I just quitted it. I I, I prefer to to talk to journalists, to, to con conversate with them, but not to really be fixing. So to, to kind of shift the same task, but to, uh, to different means. Uh, so it all depends. The journalists who are coming right now, they are not necessarily people who know much. They, they can be young people. So sometimes they, they all ask the same questions. And... Uh, you just reply. So the question, what is Ukrainian identity? I think I replied in this six months, like maybe 35 times. And uh, maybe I wrote 10 articles about this, the same question, but I'm not tired because I think we should do it the same and again and again. And this also helps us to rethink because you always try to find different words and different expressions for this. So uh, I think our task is in infinite and uh, it is good because uh, you can never, uh, like if you want to learn about country, this is an infinite thing. If, 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 if I want to learn about Lithuania or France or Germany, it's just a, 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 a or I don't know, India, this um, a time for the whole life. Uh, but the, the very important thing that we Ukrainians, I think, should be taking into account while talking to international journalists, and this is something that Ukrainians, I think, that not very many of us are actually doing, uh, and many of Ukrainians are, are they're looking at these international journalists with a certain, like, 
with a certain way that look it's it's like we are going to teach them about ukraine and i think this should be a, a reciprocal process when we when we named our podcast explaining ukraine doesn't mean that we actually want to to transfer the ready-made knowledge about ukraine to somewhere else i'm really keen uh, at I'm, i'm learning from this journalist a lot look if a journalist has a a an experience of different uh, conflicts different wars and he or she i will be telling about this this is extremely important or uh, as one very smart person has said if you know one country you know no country uh, knowledge of your country is always comparison and uh, knowing the the more other experience possible makes your country for you yourself uh, understandable so i would i would i would frame it in this way it should always be a conversation mm-hmm. Olha, some last words from you. Do you feel that? Uh, I actually more? understand why why they ask it because uh, hero of uh, our podcast to uh, the sometimes uh, tells the story how they worried about the behavior of uh, foreign journalist uh, uh, for instance uh, when they uh, try to make cry um, hero of the um, t- uh, tv episode but at the same time i memorize uh, january um, when uh, you know uh, it was a lot of uh, foreign journalists in kiev and everywhere and our people didn't understand why what they want tried to find in our country um, in that moment before the war especially people who didn't believe that uh, the full scale uh, war started and um, uh, i'm happy now that uh, that journalist uh, uh, spent a lot of time before full scale invasion because they saw how civilized our country how european our country how it's all work in our country so for me it's really uh, good that a lot of journalists uh, spent here time uh, before uh, the war um, at the t- same uh, time i don't have offense uh, for uh, journalists because a lot of uh, our citizens uh, um, even in that time don't uh, know our history so how the foreign journalist knows that uh, for example uh, 100 years ago we have had um, the same situation with uh, russian yes with uh, um, cruelty and uh, with uh, invasion so um, they learn and it's it's okay uh, we all uh, learn in that uh, difficult time so when uh, Vladimir say about explaining ukraine uh, we should understood that a lot of ukrainian also uh, learn something about uh, themselves about uh, their language about their history about culture and etc <laughs> Yes, thank you so much. I want to leave with this thought uh, that I also support so much what Volume said. It has to be a conversation. And I thank you so much for this conversation today. Uh, Olga, Katerina, Volodymyr, thank you for being uh, with us. Uh, thanks for the viewers. I don't see any questions, but we covered so many interesting things and the hour is over. I would like to really heartily invite everyone to listen to the podcasts of our today's guests. Uh, so it's Tutti Teper, uh, Stories of Journalists at War, Explaining Ukraine and Cult Podcast, um, and uh, UA, The Day That We Survived. And there's also one that we didn't cover, but I really like uh, the one uh, from Urban Space Radio, Davaita Pisla Vaini, which is also a lot of interesting conversations about people living, uh, managing to live, and also uh, talking about different new uh, questions that they arise, displaced people, language, and I really, really like that. And with the hint of uh, humor as well, which is really healing, as we all know. And then um, I invite listeners to join tomorrow also our other sessions uh, online and in person in Vilnius. And um, thank you for being uh, with us today. And we wish you a strength, wisdom, and victory. Also something that I I read uh, from Ukrainians that they would like this for, for them on this day of Ukrainian independence. 
Slava Ukraini. Thank you. Thank you very much. Heroyam Slava, thank you very much.